Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We just catch glimpses because we know so little about love, but help us, Lord, to sense your yearning over us. Help us to understand the facts of history and then help us to have an experience. Bless us now as we enter into the issue of the season the world is celebrating the coming of Jesus. Help us to understand what it really means. We thank you in his holy name. Amen. We all know the, the story, but maybe we need to look at a few little details and see what, what the story can tell us besides just the, the things we know about the stable and the animals and the <laughs> all the other things that we know about. I want to start reading a few sections from the Spirit Prophecy today. Desire of Ages 308 begins a section that I want to get into here. We'll see how far we go. Let's see. I need to back up here. I'm not sure everything is here. I see the pages in the books. It's not so clear to me when I open this up. Okay. Uh, God desires us to be happy. This is 308. Desire of Ages 308. God desires us to be happy. Well, let's see here. He gave us the precepts of the law that in obeying them we might have joy. <laughs> That's not exactly the way most people think about the law. <laughs> See? But that's the way God thinks about it, and that's what he's doing. Okay, I'm going to read it again. God desires us to be happy, and he gave us the precepts of the law that in obeying them we might have joy. When at Jesus' birth the angels sang, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. They were declaring the principles of the law which he had come to magnify and make honorable. See? Is that what people think about when they're celebrating Christmas and they hear those words? <laughs> Is that what's being preached in churches tomorrow? This is a reality we need to get a hold of. How does that work? Do we understand that? How does that little sentence do what you just said? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Well, let's, let's try to understand it just a little bit here. Glory to God. What does the word glory mean? Character. The character of God is what Jesus' coming is all about. The character of God. Jesus came to reveal who his Father was. His every act to show who God is. Now, when we see Jesus, and people have fairly good pictures of Jesus, the scriptures are pretty explicit. Jesus said of himself that he was meek, and lowly. And then uh, he says, well, have I been with you so long? You haven't known me yet? Who was that talking? He says, show me the Father. And then out of the mouth of Jesus says, have I been with you so long you still don't know me? When you see Jesus, you see the Father. And Jesus said, I am meek 
and lowly of heart. That is the Father. Now, that's not usually the way people try to formulate their gods. <laughs> the ones they make up, the ones they invent, the ones they want to serve. But the real God says he's meek and he's lowly. That really is hard to get a hold of. <laughs> because I dare say that even in our midst, there are some who worried, are worried about how they're going to do with the judgment. Well, that's not a meek and lowly God you're serving. That's a wrathful God. That's a God you're, you're afraid of. He's going to get you sometime if you don't do it just right. But the God of the Bible isn't like that. He says, I am meek and I am lowly. And he says, I love you. <laughs> and I don't love you because of what you do or you don't do. I love you. <laughs> and, you know, he's taken a great deal of pains to prove that. <laughs> He has done more than any of us could ever have thought to ask him to do already, and we can see it. <laughs> Glory to God. Reveal the character. That means that Jesus, as God, remember, he is God throughout all eternity. He's God. He was always with the Father. They were together as God. A God, a God. And I can say that because it says it like that in the spirit of prophecy. Each one by themselves is a God. Okay. Now when you get them together, of course, you have the Godhead. <laughs> You're talking about different things about the three in one God. But by himself, Jesus is God. By himself, the Father is God. Same attributes, same essence. So Jesus, the Word, that is the thought of God made audible. That's why Jesus is called the Word in the Bible. We get to hear what God is thinking. <laughs> so Jesus, as God, and the Father, as God, knew from all eternity that the devil was going to blow it. Now, there are philosophers who deny that, even among the remnant church. Yeah, there are books, there are people down at Loma Linda writing. There are people from Chicago School of Divinity writing. And in our bookshelves at the bookstore are books that say that God doesn't know everything. Well, I'm sorry, they're confused. <laughs> the Tsar of Ages, it says, from all eternity, they knew sin was coming. <laughs> I mean, what kind of a God is it that's going to be surprised? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy how people get over there with their philosophical speculations. Well, I don't want to stay in this place too long. I just want you to know that if God didn't know everything, then how can he prophesy? How can you count on a God that doesn't know everything to be able to prophesy correctly? <laughs> All right, so God knows everything. Jesus, the Father, they together understood sin was coming. They knew man would fall. And they knew what they were going to do about it. From all eternity, the Father was going to give the Son to the human race to redeem this world. And Jesus didn't have to be talked into it. He volunteered. Yes, Jesus volunteered because he's the only one that could do it. No angel could come to do what he had to do. Angels are under law. Jesus has never been under law. He's the law giver. <laughs> okay. He's the creator. 
And I'm not giving a lot of scriptures here either. The other thing you need to know, we're trying to build a, a little understanding here together. So Jesus, God, the creator, knowing what's going to happen because of freedom of choice, has volunteered that he would join the creation as a human. He would take that form. He would become human in form. Now, I say it this way because that's the way the Bible says it. The Bible never says he became a human and was not God anymore. There are some people teaching that. They say he emptied himself. Well, it's true he emptied himself of his attributes uh, and his prerogatives as God, but he was still God. He just didn't exercise those. He was still God as that man. God had the form of a man now. And when God takes the form of a man, that doesn't make him exactly like me. Don't fall into that one. He was unique. There's not another one like Jesus in all eternity. He's absolutely unique. That means one of a kind. <laughs> okay. So, Jesus then, in the incarnation, in becoming a human, did so forever. He will always have the form of a human being. God adopted humanity to himself through Jesus. So we're talking about the Father and the Son here. They're doing this together. Jesus is becoming a conduit, if you please. Jesus, God, in the form of a man, now can relate to both sides of this. God can love humans through the God Jesus. And humans can love the Father through the man Jesus. <laughs> so the Father loves humans through Jesus and humans love the Father through Jesus and it's doing this. It's a big circuit. Love from the Father to humans and from humans back to the Father through Jesus. It all operates through Jesus. Nothing happens without Jesus. In the spirit prophecy, it's called the circuit of beneficence. This is a fantastic term. Circuit of beneficence. From God to man, from man back to God through Jesus. All of it through Jesus. Okay, so. Back to um, 308. It says, when the law was proclaimed from Sinai, God made known to men the holiness of his character that by contrast they might see the sinfulness of their own now how many humans do you think that included <laughs> so when a person doesn't know they're sinful they're not seeing Jesus and when a person looks at only their sin and gets all hopeless they're still not seeing Jesus. Because Jesus is the answer. The law was given to convict them of sin and to reveal their need of a Savior. It would do this as its principles were applied to the heart by the Holy Spirit. As the light of Christ reveals to men their need of his cleansing blood and his justifying righteousness, the law is still an agent in bringing us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, Psalm 19.7. And do you know that scripture? I knew that scripture. I read it many times. But one day, it became a reality to me. It just hit me what I was saying. 
the law of the Lord is perfect. And when I sense that, and I know there's nothing I can do to keep it, there's only one thing I can do. It drives me to Christ so I can be converted. <laughs> and the law is real to me as a perfect thing because I know it's so way above me. <laughs> I need to be converted. <laughs> So this is a truth. It wasn't nailed to the cross. It's still converting people because of its perfection. We need to understand these things so we're not telling people merely scriptures. We've got to tell them the reality of it, knowing, of course, the law is perfect. <laughs> the law is perfect. <laughs> Without Jesus, it's perfect. It's a terror to me. All right. On page 309, it says, The Savior's life of obedience maintained the claims of the law. Now, I don't know of any church that says he ever disobeyed the Father. That was a perfect life of obedience. Obedience to what? To his Father's will, to the law. So Jesus was perfect in that. It proved, his life proved. Now I want you to get a hold of this. His life proved that it could be kept in humanity. That's the rest of the quote. So now, man without Christ cannot keep the law it's an utter impossibility but we better see the other side let's get over into the gospel now his life proved the law can be kept by humanity that's like jesus he kept it how did he keep it did he have a power available to him that we don't have you see, we know these things intellectually. We've got to get them inside of us now and realize Jesus didn't do anything that we don't have available to us from the Father the same way he did. He never did one thing that we can't do in his humanity. He was a human in that form the same way as we are. But without sin, how come he didn't have any sin? He was connected to the Father. And he never allowed that connection to break for any reason. He maintained the purity that Adam didn't maintain. He lost it. Hmm? Now, that purity that Jesus maintained, he died after the perfect life he died so that by faith in him he will give us the same thing he had so that if we learn to trust the way he trusted the father the father would love us the same way as he loves Jesus and will give us the same things he gave Jesus I'm going to finish reading this statement. This is a statement I used to read in all my meetings as I traveled around. All who obey as he did. <laughs> Have you ever read that sentence? <laughs> I mean, get out of that sentence. All, all who obey as he did. <laughs> are likewise declaring the law is holy and just and good. On the other hand, all who break God's commandments are sustaining Satan's claim that the law is unjust and cannot be obeyed. In my 
original desire of ages I have written on the side. Whose side are we on? <laughs> are we telling the world a Christian can obey God? Or are we telling the world it doesn't work, Satan's right? Thus they suck in the deceptions of the great adversary and cast dishonor upon God. They are the children of the wicked one who was the first rebel against God's law. To admit them into heaven would again bring in the elements of discord and rebellion and imperil the well-being of the universe. God can't take somebody to heaven who, who doesn't believe a Christian can obey God. Okay, I've got to go to another place now. now. I want to keep a train of thought here. Desire of Ages 803. At the birth of Jesus, the angel announced peace on earth and goodwill to men. And now at his first appearance, to the disciples after his resurrection, the Savior addressed them with the blessed word, Peace be unto you. So when Jesus was born, Peace unto you. Peace unto who? <laughs> to me. God says peace to you. What is peace? It doesn't mean just an absence of war. Peace is kind of nice. It's, it's a comfort. It's where two people really, everything's okay. And that's how he comes to us. He doesn't say, well, if you do this, and if you do this, and if you give up this, and if you give up. That's not God's approach at all. He comes, and the first thing out of him is he says, peace. Because that's what he wants to have with us. Peace. And there's only one way he can get it. It's through Jesus Christ. It's a call to receive Jesus so that things can work. So things can happen correctly. You see, we, we are constantly saying, well, I'm not into works. I'm not trying to work my way to heaven. I have faith. But just look at your life. What upsets you in your life? Well, it's not when you think you're doing it right. <laughs> it's when you know you're doing something that your own code says, I shouldn't be doing that. And you put yourself in the place of God and you think, well, that's the way God must be feeling right now. But that's not God. Next week, I want to talk some more about what faith really is. That's not this week, though. Because what we call faith is actually works most of the time. And I'll show you how that happens. <laughs> yeah. What we call faith is when I'm doing something right. <laughs> My works. That's not the faith of the Bible. The faith of the Bible is trusting God for everything. All the time. We'll get to it. We'll talk about that. Okay. Right now I want to stick with this, this announcement the angels made. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. The Savior addressed them with the blessed words, Peace be unto you. Jesus is ever ready to speak peace to souls that are burdened with doubts and fear. He waits for us to open the door of the heart to him and say, Abide with us. He says, Behold, I stand at the door. And I know. If any man hear my voice, open the door, I will come in. Okay. Revelation 3. All right, so there's another little thought there. Let's go someplace else. Great Controversy, page 46.
Well would it be for the church and the world if the principles that actuated those steadfast souls were revived in the hearts of God's professed people. This is at the beginning of the church. That after all, these are not... Uh, wait a minute. There is an alarming indifference in regard to the doctrines which are the pillars of the Christian faith. The opinion is gaining ground that after all, these are not of vital importance. This degeneracy is strengthening the hands of the agents of Satan so that false theories and fatal delusions which the faithful uh, in ages past imperiled their lives to resist and expose. The early Christians were indeed a peculiar people. How can the gospel be called a message of peace? <laughs> when Isaiah foretold the birth of the Messiah, he ascribed in the title Prince of Peace. When angels announced to the shepherds that Christ was born, they sang above the plains of Bethlehem, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. There is a seeming contradiction between these prophets. Uh, and the words of Christ, I came not to send peace but a sword. But rightly understood, the two are in perfect harmony. The gospel is a message of peace. Christianity is a system which received and obeyed would spread peace, harmony and happiness throughout the earth. The religion of Christ will unite in close brotherhood all who accept his teachings. It was the mission of Jesus to reconcile men to God and thus one to another. All right, there's the next clue. How do you get peace? You don't get peace by everybody saying, we love God, we serve God, and we all teach and believe different things. <laughs> you have peace when you love each other. And that's what Jesus does in a Christian. He doesn't make people who are obnoxious he doesn't make people who are constantly looking for trouble. He makes people who really do love other people because that's what Jesus does. So peace is what those angels came. Maybe we need to back up a little bit here. In Luke, the second chapter, there's a very vivid picture as you go down through there. It was tax time. Caesar Augustus was used by God to get Mary and Joseph over to the right place so Jesus could be born. They wouldn't have gone over there if it hadn't been for that Caesar. <laughs> so that Caesar was, was used to get the population back to their towns. In this case, Bethlehem. So they made their way over there. And we know that they went in through the front gate of the city. They were all walled cities. And they walked down the main street, narrow little street, looking for a place to stay, and they got all, all the way to the other side, and nobody could find a place for them. Now, this is Mary with God in human form now, waiting to be born. Now, long before Jesus had told the angels, the things are going to go haywire and he would have to become a human being. And in the process of doing that, God would suffer through pain and all that. But he would become a human. And as a human, he would do more suffering. And he would eventually be killed by humans. And the angels at first, that grieved them. They didn't like that one a little bit. But then they, as he talked to them and he told them what it meant, that this was the plan of salvation that was devised, and they realize, well, he's going to save a whole world by doing this. <laughs> and then they had joy. And they sang this song. Glory to God. <laughs> Look what he has devised. He's going to save those humans after all. Good will to men. And so the angels were happy. Long before the incarnation, they sang that song. But when the incarnation actually came, they came to make the announcement. He's going to be born now. And they came to Jerusalem. It's an interesting thing that in all the commentaries I've been able to find, none of them 
understand that the angels went to God's church first. They all say he passed them by. But God didn't do that. Those angels were sent to the leaders of God's church. Those angels were sent to the ministers, to the ones who were supposed to be preaching truth, who were supposed to be preparing the people for this wonderful event. And when the angels came, what did they find? <laughs> Not mere ignorance. Indifference. I could care less. After waiting all that time, they gave up. And the angels came. And they were absolutely amazed that the leadership of God's church were not looking for Jesus. And they left. But they went there first. They left in utter disgust at what was happening there at Jerusalem. But they heard somebody pray. <laughs> yeah, shepherds out there in the hills with their animals. And they usually did that in the summertime. What they did was they'd take their animals out in the spring and they'd live with them outside. With the, they'd take care of them. They'd take shifts so that every three hours somebody was with the animals through the night watching for robbers and all of that. And the Bible indicates that's what they were doing. They were out there with their animals doing this nightly shift protecting them. So the climate had to be good. It was not the rainy season, which is December. <laughs> And they're praying, they're talking to each other, they're thinking about the coming of the Messiah, they're actually thinking about it. And the one angel came, and the way the Bible portrays it, the angel was on top of them, kind of hovering like a helicopter. <laughs> talking to them, scared them. <laughs> because anything from heaven has got to be bad news. I mean, they came to really do us in. <laughs> That's what most people think about something when heaven comes really close. Oh, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> but the angel right away said, oh, no, don't be afraid. I've, I've come with a message of joy for you. The angel was all excited, all happy. And what the shepherds didn't know was there was a bunch of other angels, a multitude, it says, of angels hiding. <laughs> and they're, they're all there. They could hardly contain themselves. They want to get it out. <laughs> they got to tell somebody. <laughs> and so the angel is saying this. And finally, they couldn't contain it anymore. They said, we're not waiting anymore. Boom. <laughs> it says the whole, whole place was lit up with the glory of these angels. And here they are singing, glory to God. Glory to God in the highest. What's that mean, in the highest? Well, not just the place, but in the highest sense that there can be glory to God in the highest way possible. Look at what he's done. He's found a way to save this world. By Jesus coming here and becoming one of them, part of their form. Glory to God in the highest. Peace to you. Peace. Goodwill to men. That's God. These angels know God, and that's what they're saying. Look, we've come here to give you the good news. <laughs> So we have the background refreshed in our mind. Let's look at this then a little bit more. Uh-oh. Patriarchs and Prophets 65. When Jesus told them the first time, the angels prostrated themselves at the feet of their commander and they offered to become a sacrifice for man. But an angel's life could not pay the debt. Only he who created man had the power to redeem him. So that explains Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, which many groups 
try to make something entirely different from what the Bible is saying. Jesus is the creator and the redeemer. The Sabbath is for both reasons. Christ assured the angels that by his death he would ransom many and would destroy him who had power of death. And my Bible says Jesus came to destroy him, not to give him a place to live forever. He would recover the kingdom which man had lost by transgression and the redeemed were to inherit it with him and dwell therein forever. Sin and sinners would be blotted out. Never more to disturb the peace of heaven or earth. He bade the angelic host to be in accord with the plan that his father had accepted and rejoiced that through his death fallen man could be reconciled to God. Then joy, inexpressible joy, filled heaven. <laughs> the glory and blessedness of a world redeemed outmeasured even the anguish and the sacrifice of the prince of life. Through the celestial courts echoed the first strains of that song which was to ring out above the hills of Bethlehem. Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. <laughs> One selected messages, 2.51, I think. Let's see, it starts on 250 and goes over. Now, I, I thought this is a rather interesting thought. Jesus came and he was born not in a nice house, not in a hospital. But all that was left in that town after they walked clear through it was a stable where the animals were. <laughs> and that's where the world's redeemer was going to be born. That's where he was born. Now the next time you get a proud thought, try to remember that. <laughs> God volunteered to humble himself to that. And that was just the beginning of his humility. He kept going down, down, down until they beat him up, pulled the hairs out of his face, cut him, and then crucified him, stuck a spear in him, put thorns on him, and things the Bible doesn't describe. Here's the thought I want you to get now from this sentence with that in mind. No one born into the world, not even the most gifted of God's children, has ever been accorded such a demonstration of joy as greeted the babe born in Bethlehem. <laughs> Angels of God sang his praises over the hills and the plains of Bethlehem. Glory to God in the highest, they sang, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Oh, that today the human family could recognize this song. The declaration then made, the note then struck, the tune then started, will swell and extend to the end of time and resound to the ends of the earth. It is the glory of God. It is the peace on earth, goodwill to men. When the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, the song then started in the hills of Bethlehem will be re-echoed by the voice of a great multitude as the voice of many waters saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. <laughs> it's the same song. <laughs> she, she ends with this. It might help us in some other thoughts. The Holy Spirit, which proceeds from the only begotten Son of God, binds the human agent, body, soul, and spirit to the perfect divine human nature of Christ. This union is represented by the union of the vine and the branches. Finite man is united to the manhood of Christ. See, that's not you believing in somebody. That's you and somebody being one person. <laughs> 
And we are, when we are one person with Jesus Christ, we have whatever he has. The life that's in him is in us. We are no longer just humans. We are a new creation. <laughs> and that new creation has power, the power of Jesus. Six T four twenty one. <coughs> Talking about the Christians at the beginning, it says the world took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus, sinful men, repentant, pardoned, cleansed and sanctified, were brought into partnership with God through his Son. The believers sought earnestly to receive and obey every word of God. Filled with love for the Redeemer, they sought as their highest aim to win souls to Him. That was it. That's what they lived for. To win souls to Him. They did not think of hoarding the precious treasure of the grace of Christ. They felt the importance of their calling and waited with the message. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. They burned with desire to carry the glad tidings to the earth's remotest bound. Did you catch the message? <laughs> Peace on earth, goodwill to men. That was their message. It wasn't Saturday's the Sabbath. It is, but that wasn't their message. When the people get the peace of God in their hearts and they know he is goodwill to him, they will have goodwill to others. And when we have goodwill for each other, now you can tell people about the Sabbath. You know, I, I have watched very carefully the last 20 years. I have been involved in the history of this world for the last 20 years. I've, I have watched the various motions, the movements, the reformers, the let's, let's get the church doing it right. And you know what? There's always been one thing lacking. They do not teach people how to love other people. They do not teach people to love people that disagree with you. They're the enemy. Well, I have to tell you, I know where that spirit comes from. Whenever somebody tries to force you to believe their way, they have the mark of Cain. Now, you know who Cain was. He was the world's first murderer. You be careful what you're listening to, what you're being exposed to. If you're not somehow growing in Christ so that you can love people, there's something wrong. That influence is not coming from God. What's the message? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. From God to us, from Jesus through us to others. After a time, she's talking about the Ephesian church. Remember what Jesus said to them? Uh, you be careful because if your lampstand goes out, I'm going to remove you. Your candlesticks, you won't have them anymore. And he did physically do that to that city. The harbor moved several miles. It was no longer a harbor. Their lampstand was taken away. <laughs> Reading again, it says, But after a time, the zeal of the believers, their love for God, and for one another began to wane. Coldness crept into the church. Differences sprang up and the eyes of many were turned from beholding Jesus as the author and finisher of their faith. 
The masses that might have been convicted and converted by a faithful practice of the truth were left unwarned. Then it was that the message was addressed to the Ephesian church by the true witness. Their lack of interest in the salvation of souls showed they had lost their first love. For none can love God with the whole heart, mind, soul, and strength without loving those for whom Christ died. <laughs> so it's an index. Where am I? Do I not care anymore when I'm talking to people whether they have salvation or not? Something's happening. Now something should be telling me, you know, they could be lost if I don't start praying for them, if I don't look for an opening. It's something. Okay, I'm going to back up now to another place. I would like to, in the time remaining, remind you of some really wonderful statements Let's see. What do I want to do here? I want to... Okay, how about... All right, sometime in the next day or two, if you would take the time to read the first four chapters of Desire of Ages, I guarantee you that you will learn some things you didn't know before. I don't care how many times you've read this book. During this time, God wants you to understand certain things because people will be talking to you. And you will be able to have some things in the back of your mind. I'm going to go through just a few things here. Starting uh, on page 20 and, and moving through very quickly. God's wonderful purpose of grace the mystery of redeeming love is the theme into which angels desire to look. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. By the way, uh, what are en endless e ages? What would we call that? Time. <laughs> time and eternity. You can't have eternity without having some time going by. Okay. Now, maybe I should say that another way since I brought it up. Doesn't Isaiah say something about we're going to worship from one Sabbath to another, from one moon to another? I mean, that's a stated amount of time, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there are circuits involved. <laughs> All right. So going on here, it will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. Self-sacrificing love. In the life of Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life. So in God's world, that's the law of life, is self-sacrificing love. The love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God. That's who God is. And that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in a lie which no man can approach unto. So I didn't make that up. The Spirit of Prophecy says it. The meek and lowly one. That's the life of him. Capital H. <laughs> God. Now, I'm moving on to another place. Now, sin has marred God's perfect work, yet the handwriting remains. Even now, all created things declare the glory of His excellence. There's nothing, nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or a lowly blade of grass, but has its ministry. <laughs> Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. 
And man and animal in turn minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers breathe fragrance and unfold their beauty and blessing to the world. The sun shields its light, sh excuse me, sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean itself, the source of all springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land, but takes to give. And she goes on with that thought. The angels of glory find their joy in giving. Giving love and tireless watch care to souls that are fallen and unholy. Heavenly beings woo the hearts of men. They bring to this dark world light from the courts above. By gentle and patient ministry, they move upon the human spirit to bring the lost into fellowship with Christ, which is even closer than they themselves can know. They're bringing us a gift they can't have. <laughs> Why is that? Well, he has created them. They move and have a being that he's created. But he has done more than create us. He's given us his life. We are living his life in us. We are one with him. You remember he tried to say it. I'm the... The vine, and you're the branches. Well, you know, only one branch gets on the vine. You don't get another <laughs> vine on the <a> vine. <laughs> Just one, one vine on each on the branch. It's impossible for, for God to be a grandfather. <laughs> he could only be a father. <laughs> so it's a direct connection. And when... That vine has sap running through it. That exact same sap is running through the vine. If that sap is not in the vine, the vine is dead. It has to be the life of Jesus in a Christian. And you do not become a Christian by trying. You become a Christian by believing when God says, that's what I've done. <laughs> and keep believing it not based on what you're doing or not doing but keep believing because that's what he said and that's how it works page 22 the earth was dark through misapprehension of God that the gloomy shadows might be lightened that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. Love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love Him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. The work, that work, only one being in all the universe could do. Only He who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. This is why only one equal with God could do this plan of salvation. He had to know everything about God. And knowing everything about God, now he can let you know. <laughs> I'm going to read you this sentence just so you know it's really there. It's on page 221. It says, From the beginning God in Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man. So you need never guess what these philosophers are saying. There is one sentence in the spirit prophecy, and there's more, but that one says they knew. <laughs> okay? You need never be confused on this issue.
Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. This is a voluntary sacrifice. Jesus might have remained at the Father's side. He might have retained the glory of heaven and the homage of angels, but he chose to give back the scepter into the Father's hands and to step down from the throne of the universe. Now, he did not cease being God. He stepped down. That's what he did. Nearly 2,000 years ago, and this sentence always gets me when I read it, nearly 2,000 years ago, a voice of mysterious import was heard in heaven from the throne of God. Lo, I come, sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. <laughs> voice of Jesus talking to the Father. I come to do your will. How can a Christian say it's not important to want to do the will of God? That one doesn't compute to me how people can say obedience is just kind of a secondary thing. It's not important. It seems to me there's something really wrong. Jesus said, I come to do your will. And Jesus is not only my substitute, he's my example. A body hast thou prepared me. Had he appeared with the glory that was his with the Father before the world was, we could not have endured the light of his presence, that we might behold it and not be destroyed. The manifestation of his glory was shrouded. His divinity was veiled with humanity. It doesn't say he gave it up. It says it was veiled. Veiled. And she said that many times. Now, here's something I hope you will remember if somebody tries to tell you something different. Here's the rest of the sentence. The invisible glory in the visible human form. That's an exact quote. The invisible glory, the glory of God in that visible human form. And now something that you may or may not have... Uh, really had come to your senses. She talks then about how this works. The burning bush. <laughs> we know about the burning bush. This is the burning bush in which Christ appeared to Moses revealed God. The symbol chosen for the representation of the deity was a shrub. <laughs> yeah, Moses could look at that bush. Well, I don't know what that bush looked like, but in that part of the world, they had scraggly bushes. <laughs> it was not a beautiful, gorgeous thing. It was just a little old prickly thing. And that bush was a symbol of God. Oh, the page, oh, no, the page is, um, the entire page is two, let's see, 23. We're not very far here. 23, yeah. Tremendous. The entire page is 23. That shrub <laughs> represented divinity. Well, maybe we can get a little better picture now. He came in the likeness of man. A lot of people try to make something out of that. We've got a lot of Greek scholars in our world of scenes. You know, homo, they go, they want to tell you what it says, and it means exactly like us. Well, I'm sorry, that's not what the Greek word really means. He came in the likeness of men. He certainly was a human, but he wasn't only a human. So that makes it very special, and he had no sin. That's certainly not like me. It says he was made in the likeness of men, Here's what she says about that. In the eyes of the world, he possessed no beauty. That's what Isaiah says. Now, have you thought about that, Lisa? Or do you have these wonderful pictures in the books? Oh, these chiseled features and the wonderful manicured hair and the 
My Bible says there was no beauty there that you would look at him and say, Ah, oh, Hollywood. Jesus didn't come to dazzle anybody. He came to show what an ordinary person walking around looks like who lives spiritually. No beauty. The light of heaven on earth. His glory was veiled. The greatness and majesty were hidden that he might draw near to sorrowful, tempted men. She talks for a little bit about the sanctuary. Make me a sanctuary. We've studied into that that I may dwell with you. She says, since Jesus came to dwell with us, we know that God is acquainted with our trials and sympathizes with our griefs. Every son and daughter of Adam may understand that our Creator is a friend of sinners. <laughs> a friend, not this terrible judge watching you all the time, waiting to see you do something wrong so he can say, well, you didn't make it. What kind of horrible picture is that? That's what the devil has done. The devil has gotten inside the remnant church and made theologies that don't exist with God. Laurie and I were talking just the other day. She came in through a, quote, conservative branch. She didn't get over to the mainstream church. It's the, the, the do-gooders that got her first. And she says, I'm still not over it. They taught me about a God of wrath. And she's still, it's in her. She, she knows it's not true. But that's what she learned about the remnant church. They believe in a God of wrath who's looking at you all the time to catch you doing something wrong. Our Creator is the friend of sinner for in every doctrine of grace every promise of joy every deed of love every divine attraction presented in the Savior's life on earth we see God with us that's what we need to see when we see Jesus God with us he's my friend He took our nature, passed through our experiences. In all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Hebrews 2.17 If we had to bear anything which Jesus did not endure, then upon this point Satan would represent the power of God as insufficient for us. Therefore, Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are. Hebrews 4.15 He endured every trial to which we are subject. And he exercised in his own behalf no power that is not freely offered to us. Page 24. We're over to page 24 now. But if you read through these chapters, you'll find all of these. <laughs> They're not big chapters. But I really hope you'll get in and read these chapters. They're going to tell you things. As man... He met temptation and overcame in the strength given him from God. He says, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. His life testifies that it is possible for us also to obey the law of God. <laughs> he proved it. He became... That God became a man in form and then did everything as a man. He did not exercise his God prerogatives. He did it all as a man, the way any man can do it, if 
they will be in subjection to the Father as he was. That's Desire of Ages 664. We're not going to get there today. <laughs> but these statements are everywhere in this group prophecy. We need to believe what Jesus came for to reveal the kind of character he wants us to have, the character of the Father. Now, we can't do this by ourselves. That's the hang-up. People are trying to get good. You can't get good. You have to become a Christian. <laughs> He gave us an example of obedience as the Son of Man, as the Son of God. He gives us power to obey. Now, you see the problem here? If you make him only a man, where are you ever going to get the power to be a Christian? <laughs> he has to be God. God, man, now you got the whole package. <laughs> I am. I am. I was talking to one of our theologians. I shouldn't be talking to about some of these people. You might identify with them sometimes. And he told me that Jesus was just like us. And this is a theologian. That they're out there. And I looked at him, I said, really? Do you really believe that? Well, let's try and let's see how much you believe that. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Say it. <laughs> I am the life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am. Go ahead, say it. He's just like you. And even with that, he wouldn't get off of it. He had to find some reason that Jesus could say that, and he couldn't. And he isn't the only one. I have met quite a few people who will not get off, even under the most simple things to look at. I am. I am. He says, all Power in heaven and earth has been given to me. God with us. That's what we have in Jesus. That's what happened here when he came to this earth. It wasn't just a baby being born. It was God entering our arena, our time and space. He always had time and space, but when he came into ours, that's creation. That's a different thing to deal with. In that time and space, God is with us. He came here to be with us, not just so we could look at him, but so we could participate in his life with him. God with us, quote, is the surety of our deliverance from sin, the assurance of our power to obey the law of heaven. What's the law of heaven? Love. That's what, that's what the law is. It's about love. When we think of it as a code of things to do and not to do, we've missed it. It's about love. The first four commandments, the first table. You will have only one God. You know what? I think many of us are just struggling with that. I've got a better God than the real God. It's my brain. <laughs> I'll figure out what I need to know. <laughs> I'm my own God. That's pretty bad. <laughs> No, he says, you will have only one God, and it's not you. It's me, the real God. <laughs> Always, all the time. And if you really have faith in me, all of your works are accepted in Jesus Christ. All of them. You mean when I did that thing wrong again? Yes. That does not take you out of Christianity. We'll work it out in you. We'll get this done. But you have to keep trusting. 
When you try to do it yourself, it'll never happen. You mean I have to tell myself I'm still a Christian even though my conscience is killing me? That's right. Because your conscience is not reliable. Only the Word is reliable. We've got to get over there with all the Christians of the past who understood this. There are many, many stories of Christians who... Now I've got stories running through my head. I've got to... <laughs> All right, let's continue here. We must be up to about page 24, 25 now. Let's see here. All right, this one you, you probably have underlined, so I want you to, to notice. It says, Christ was treated as we deserve that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which we ha he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. <laughs> End of statement. We are healed. Not going to be healed. He's not going to do something new, something different. He's already done it. With his stripes, we are healed. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man, but in Christ we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. We're closer to God now than if we had never sinned. In another place, in desire ages way down the book, she says God has more pleasure in his agonizing saints than he does in all the angels I never found. God really loves us. He has something invested in us we don't understand. He's paid a tremendous price to make sure it all works. It can't fail. But we have to get over there with him and be part of the process he's working. Really believe what he says. I am is the daysman between God and humanity laying his hands upon both. He who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, is not ashamed to call us brethren. Now, I, I want you to notice something. That in the context of that statement, always in the spirit of prophecy, she never uses that to refer to people who are in rebellion against God. The drunk in the gutter who's there because he wants to be there and rejects the Son of God and the mercy that God has given to him and says, I don't want that. Jesus does not call that one brethren. It's people who are redeemed for all eternity. Let me read a little further on. Christ glorified is our brother. Heaven is enshrined in humanity and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. As his people, God says, they shall be the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land. For how great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. The exaltation of the redeemed will be an eternal testimony to God's mercy. Who is she talking about? The redeemed. There's nothing about those who are lost. The lost people are not brethren of Christ. So let's notice in Hebrews, the second chapter, when it says he's not ashamed to call them brethren, it's talking about the sanctified, those who belong to God. It's not talking about the human race at all. Okay? This is where A.T. Jones went wrong. He said that included Adam and every human being that ever came out of Adam. No, it's the redeemed. This is an offer to all humans. Yes, it's available to everyone. 
But not everyone is going to be in eternity with God. Only those who receive what he has for them, who trust, who have faith. God can't take a person who doesn't have faith in him to heaven. All right, we need to close. We're, uh, well, there are three more chapters after this that have lots of comments. I'm just going to finish this particular chapter. By love, self-sacrifice, the inhabitants of earth and heaven are bound to their creator in bonds of indissoluble union. Our little world under the curse of sin, the one dark blot in his glorious creation, will be honored above all other worlds in the universe of God. Here, where the Son of God tabernacled in humanity, where the King of glory lived and suffered and died, here, when he shall make all things new, the tabernacle of God shall be with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. So when this thing's all over, God's going to move his home right here where we are so he can constantly be with us. So I guess back in the dark ages there, they were right. The earth is the center of the universe. <laughs> or going to be in here. Okay, next week we want to talk about faith. Saving faith the way God deals with the subject in his word so that we can know when our faith is not dead works. <laughs> we want to have the works that are always of faith. All right, let's, let's, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you that we don't need to be theologians to be your children. But we thank you that your word is sure and that we can study and in your spirit you can guide us and teach us that we can have an experience with you to connect with your mind. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus did come. The world perhaps is laying emphasis to the wrong places, but at least there is a general acknowledgement at this time of the year that he did come. We pray that we may understand as your children that he came for a purpose, that he is fulfilling that purpose. And as we trust him and live with him and hold his hand, that we will be wherever he is. We thank you in his holy name. Amen.